And if you, if you don't know me, my name is David, and I'm the, um, the pastor of the part of the Woodlands Church that meets in this building. And um, if you know me as well, you'll, you'll know that I use the phrase both and to the point where it's annoying. It's, it's become a bit of a kind of cliche in, in Woodies, but um, it's an important phrase, and we're going to unpack a little bit of it tonight. Both and. In fact, it's not my phrase, of course. There's lots of people who use it. Uh, I'm particularly, I'd like to recommend a book uh, called Both And, which is written by a, a vineyard pastor from uh, Ohio in America um, called Rich Nathan, which is a great book. However, um, I, I'm sharing what I shared now before I read his book. So, um, but he's, he's a great guy. He's been a great influence. It's a Coast Height music stand. It's not good enough for me. Um, <laughs> As we, as we think about both and, for many of us, living with tension is a challenge. And yet, life is full of tension. And some of that tension is creative tension. If there wasn't tension, things wouldn't work. Actually, we've just been singing. And in music, there, there's tension that comes in music. There are chords that need to resolve, and, and, and yet their presence gives a richness to music. And you, you know you can feel that suspended fourth note, whatever it is, and you think, hmm, that needs to resolve into something. And you can feel it even if you don't understand music. But the tension makes it work. There's, there's lots of things that, that only work where they're in tension. A bow and arrow, it only works when it's in tension. A violin bow, it only works when it's in tension. And so many big ideas only work when they're held together in tension. So we're going to look at some of these ideas, some of these concepts, and I think it's important not just for understanding Woodlands Church, though it is important for that. I also think it's important to understand ourselves and God and the world we live in and the nature of reality. And um, I guess Rich Nathan would make the place that in, would make the, would the case that intelligent church is a both and church. The intelligent people understand both hands. And so we're going to begin though by looking at the Bible, and I'm going to read from. Colossians 1, verses 16 to 20. And you can, it may come up on the screen, it sometimes does. You know, I have been known to read completely the wrong passage on the screen, just because it's there. But um, if we can get that up there, that would be helpful, but don't worry too much. Colossians, Colossians 1, 16 to 20. The supremacy of Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. When we're thinking about the tensions in, in reality and the tensions in our lives and the tensions in church, it all holds together in Jesus. He makes sense of it all. And um, ultimately, he's the, the only resolution for all that we have. But God, by very nature, loves to create and hold things in creative tension. So I just want to think about some of the kind of 
Why does that happen? When, when God decided to create in the first place, he made man and woman. The image of God was going to be revealed in two people in creative tension. And if you've ever been in a relationship as a man with a woman, or vice versa, you'll know there's quite often some creative tension there, which makes the whole thing exciting. A bit of wooing and um, all that kind of stuff. And um, Yeah, anyway. <laughs> but, but the whole of, of Genesis is about both ands, light and dark. You know, creatures and, and humanity. And... and as we read these things and, and look at reality, we, we think that reality itself is held in tension. When you, when you think about science, you think, hmm, light, what is it? A particle, a wave, both these things, we hold it in tension. We think about the nature of, of quantum physics, you know, in um, reality, and, and you have to understand the nature of the universe, you need to hold big ideas in tension. Now, the problem for us is, because we don't like tension, most of us, we want to resolve and come down on one side or another, particularly in philosophy or in arguments. You know, we want to come down on one side. We, and, and very often, the nature of church has been, church has polarized, even internally, over issues which it should really learn to hold together. It's polarized around some of the big ideas that we have about following God and the nature of God. And as a result, it's pushed people away. And people have adopted ideas or positions that are further than where they began because they're in this kind of opposition to one another. And the church has been literally bedeviled by a failure to hold things in tension that it should. And, and one thing that is both a delight and frustration about Woody's, I think, actually, is that sometimes it's hard to pin down exactly where the church stands on certain things because we're often not wanting to come down wholly on one side or another. We're wanting to hold things in tension. Uh, more of this than on. But um, the early church had to explore some tensions, and it comes out in our theology. Upstairs, right now, Phil Thomas will be talking about the Trinity. What a, what a big idea for the early church. They had to resolve the idea, is God one or is God three? What are we going to make about this creative idea? Here's the Jews that had learned after years of struggle with idols and from a multi-God polytheistic society, there's just one God, one name, one God to be worshipped. And then Jesus bursts on the scene of history and we discover that God is Trinity, Holy Spirit, Jesus the Son. And what does the church decide as it debates that? It says, well, it's both and. God is three in one. One God expressed in three persons. It's both and. And the early church had to wrestle with who Jesus was. Is Jesus human or divine? So much of what we read about Jesus, it's human. He gets hungry. He asks questions. He gets tired. He's put to death, literally. How can that be? And yet, he walks on water. He knows stuff. The glory of God is in him. He forgives sins. He's raised from the dead. Who is Jesus? Is he fully God or is he fully man? And the, question, the, the answer is he's both. He is fully God and fully man. And it doesn't really work unless he is both. Now that, that's a, a, a thing to get your head around, of course. But it's really true. And um, other questions of theology. They're really important ones. Do we have free will, or is God in charge? Is God sovereign? What's the right answer? You know the right answer, don't you? God is sovereign. He works for good in all things. His purposes will be worked out in the earth. There, you know, God is the Lord of history. He's fulfilling his purposes. And yet, we live making choices out of free will. Every day. It's both and. God has given us freedom, and yet he is sovereign. And the danger, of course, is that when you grasp one insight from Scripture, you think you've got the whole of it, and you discard other things. And we want what is to kind of have a, a, a biblical 
culture, biblical understanding, where we can grasp and grapple with big ideas and not push people away or not come down so heavily on one aspect of truth that we completely miss another aspect of truth. What about people? We've talked a bit about theology, both anding. People are both and people. You know, people are creatures. Look at you. Smell you. <laughs> it's been a hot day. You know, we're, we're creatures. We've got biology. You know, we, we, we start from a little cell that is reproduced. We die. Bits of our bodies drop off during life. Our ears and noses keep growing all our life, which is bad news for me. You know. But we are, we're very biological. We're affected by our biology. You know, we're affected by our hormones. Some people more than others. We're affected by being hungry or thirsty or not sleeping enough. And yet, we're spiritual. We're rational. We can forgive. We can discern beauty. We can reach out for the invisible God. We can actually have connection with the invisible God. We can get revelation of his purposes and will. We can, we can know the, the unseen God. He speaks to us. We can love him and know that he loves us. What an extraordinary thing. C.S. Lewis describes us as being amphibians, both in the material world and the spiritual world at the same time, both creatures and somehow with, with divinity in us, because we're made in the image of God, unique in the, all of God's creation. So we're both and. And that affects we do life. The things that are most creaturely are not separated from our spirituality. So what's the most creaturely thing? So things like sex and food. They're actually invested with incredible spiritual significance. It's because we're both and people. And that's why it's so confusing. There's no such thing as just a creaturely act that doesn't have a spiritual ripple, a spiritual effect on us or on other people. What an extraordinary life to live, a both and creature that you are. And as a church, following Jesus, both and people, following a both and God, with a both and Savior, it's not surprising that we have both and values. And church has values, and we draw our values both from the Bible and from the sense of mission and call that we have. I believe that God has called this church into being, that we have a purpose to fulfill in this city at this time. And under God, under the authority of Scripture, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we have values that affect the way we do life. But they're very much both and values. And you'll find in so many ways the way we do church, it's really hard to understand it. I, unless you, you, you celebrate the both and. and it's in, in fact, it's difficult to get the best out of it. Very often, um, people like an aspect of church or dislike an aspect of church. Some people are really hungry for Bible teaching and they would like nothing more than a 45 minute or hour long expositional talk. Other people have got the attention span of a gnat <laughs> and they get bored really quickly. <laughs> and, they, and that's not what they want. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I don't want to be rude or offensive. And that was just a joke, really. But, um, but you know, we want different things. And, and we talk about purpose-driven church. And Rick Warren wrote, wrote an amazing book about the purpose-driven church. He talked about the five purposes of church. Church is a place for worship and a place for fellowship, a place for teaching and discipleship, a place for care for the poor, a place for outreach and evangelism. And church, you should have these things, and we're led by these purpose. But we also talk about being a presence-led church that we're not just driven by an activism or a kind of strategy, but actually we believe that God himself is shaping and leading and directing us, and he speaks to us by his spirit. But it's not one or the other. We're not just purpose-driven. We're not just presence-led. We want to know our purpose, what we're called for. We want to be strategic, but we're all wanting to be interrupted and guided and shaped by the direct leadership of God's Holy Spirit. 
Other things about church. We're here as a church that wants to reach a world. And so what should we be like? Should we have excellence or informality? Do people need a really informal, messy, organic kind of way of doing church? Or do they need to be really touched and affected by the excellence that they see? Well, it's possible to come by the, you know, our worship session tonight. <laughs> Maybe it was a bit both handish. It was a bit informal, but there's some excellence there, wasn't there? But um, actually, along the continuum of the ways we express church, some things are more appropriate at some time than others. One of the things that we say about church, for instance, just to understand it, church has many expressions. Small church has a dominant paradigm of family, which is really key to what church is all about. Church is meant to be family. And when church gathers as family... There's an intimacy and an informality, and excellence isn't the big deal. You know, if you rock by your, your parents' house, it's a Saturday afternoon, and you, you, you show up, you're looking scruffy, there's beans on toast for tea, and uh, you sit down and maybe you watch the telly afterwards, that's maybe quite a good evening. And it's informal. But if you have visiting you, a stranger, perhaps an important stranger or someone you've never met before, perhaps you, you just work at things and you think, oh, I'm going to make a really nice meal. I really want to welcome them and honor them. And perhaps I'm, 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 perhaps I'm not wearing my, my underwear when they come around, you know, or, or whatever it is. But there's something about church, you know, where people are here and they know everybody. And someone is leading us. We enjoy the fact of them leading us, whoever they are, because we love them. And if they, they're not the greatest worship leader or the greatest speaker, it doesn't matter. But if you don't know those people, and if it's a bigger crowd, excellence becomes more important as you try and build a bridge of connection. And that's actually why we have different values around our public leading of meetings when we do small church and when we do large church. And our smallest church of all is our home group. And it's completely informal and everyone gets to play. And our largest church is here on Sunday nights. And the bar's a bit higher in terms of what we ask for. They let me in tonight, but, you know, normally speaking. But it's, it's, there are values that drive it. But it's not one or the other. We want to have both in our diet. We want to have informality and excellence. And we need both things in our diet. And along that line, are we a church that is seeker-sensitive or pursuing signs and wonders and miracles and the manifest presence of God and the mystical and the numinous. Well, we definitely want to do both, don't we? Do we? See, the early church was not polarized in that way. The Jewish church was a church for those that belonged. The temple was for Jews primarily quarter Gentiles, but the access into the temple was for Jews. The synagogue was a place for the Jewish community. But the early church was a place for believers, but it was also a place for seekers. And so when Paul is describing the worship of the early church, he says, if an unbeliever or someone who doesn't understand is among you, and hears you all speaking in tongues at once, when they think you're mad, but if they hear you Speaking prophetically, the revelation of God, and they open the secrets of their hearts, they'll fall down on their knees and say, God is really among you. And so Paul, when he's talking to a church about worship, he says, yeah, we, we expect unbelievers and seekers to be present, and that's good. And therefore, the way we worship bears that in mind. We don't want to confuse people or put people off by being weird. But we want genuine Holy Spirit revelation. We want that. And to be honest, if people experience a living word from God prophetically, if their body is healed and they're not a Christian and they're a seeker, they are not going to be put off. They're going to say God is really among you. So we want to find models of pursuing the supernatural that allow the presence of God to be found 
by the church and by seekers. Here at Wood is one way that we do that, is um, we have some gatherings that are particularly for pressing into the signs and wonders things. And Hungry for More is one of those. We've just begun a, a series called Living a Supernatural Lifestyle. And we have some gatherings, last Sunday was one of those actually, where we're particularly conscious we may have unchurched people among us. As we celebrated Love Running and we had guests there, it was different from the Hungry for More service we'd had beforehand. But it's both and, they're both part of our diet. And on any given Sunday there will be different degrees of that coming in because we are a place for seekers. But we're also committed to pursuing the revelation of God and the presence and power of God's Holy Spirit. I could keep on with lots of both hands, and so I will. <laughs> you know, do we have programs, or are we looking for revival? Just for the breaking out of God? Well, we're, we're both. You know, great to have revival, but we're not going to just do nothing while we wait. Evangelism. Is evangelism process? or precipitate moment. Now the truth is, it's both. Most people who are exploring a relationship with Jesus Christ, or coming to know Jesus, coming to understand him, are in process. For some people that process takes years. Some of you tonight might be in process. You're here, not having made up your mind, but curious, sympathetic, warm, but you, you may, when push comes to shove, say, well, I'm not sure that I would say I was a fully devoted Christian right now. And many people need to hear and reflect on the gospel a number of times. Actually, that's why Alpha is, is such a great tool, because it's a process. You can come along to Alpha, and if you're exploring, it's designed to let you be in process without making commitment. You can do Alpha, and at the end of the course, they say, thanks, I've heard you, I don't want this, I'm off. And, 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 and that's part of the deal. You haven't let anyone down by doing that. But for many people, becoming a Christian is like a relationship with anybody where you get to know them and you become more attracted to them and you become more committed to them and, and that's brilliant. And along the way, there's usually a moment of decision. The boy asks the girl out or asks her to marry him. You know, there's a precipitate moment along an exploration. And we want to create in, in church life not just the opportunity for people to be in process, but for people to say yes I do want to take advantage of this moment to say to God, I believe in you, I want to give my life to you. I want to um, receive the mercy that you're offering to me. And I want to be a follower of God and a follower of Jesus Christ and to serve him all my days. And along the way, there will be opportunities in this church, and there should be, for people to take a moment while they're in process to say, now is the time. And I want to follow Jesus. And it might be that tonight's the time for that. It's when we have communion, it might be time. It might be when someone gives a, an appeal after a talk. Say, now is the time. And we need to understand that for most people, it's both and. Some people love at first sight, but most people, it's process in following Jesus. So if we're going to think about sharing our faith, we think process, but we give opportunities for a moment. Words or wonders? Both. Good deeds or good words? Both. So let, let me think about authority. Where does authority come from? We need authority. You know, what's true? Who's to say what's right or wrong? How do we live as a church family? Where does our authority come from? We haven't got a Pope, We've got Rob. Anyway, <laughs> this is good, isn't he? You know, obviously, he's got a moustache, but anyway. Um, authority. authority comes in both hands ways. It comes scripture and spirit. And, I think, the reflected wisdom of the church. Often, there are Christians who say, my authority is simply the Bible alone. If that's what you say then you're not actually listening to what the Bible says. 
Jesus says about authority, he says, you're in error because you know neither the Bible nor the Spirit of God. Jesus talks about the revelation of the Spirit opening Scripture so that we can understand it. We need the power of God and the Bible for our authority. They're not antagonists. The Spirit is, fills. People who wrote Scripture were filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter describes people not making up words, but writing and speaking as the Spirit drove them along. It's a Spirit-filled book. And the Spirit interprets the book and gives life to it. But we also critique the manifestation of the Spirit, the life of the Holy Spirit, the numinous, the weird, the peculiar, in the light of Scripture, because there's no contradiction there. So we're both and. Our authority is both and. And also, the, the church has meditated on Scripture for 2,000 years and studied, and, and people have given, Spirit-filled people have given their, their, their best thought and attention and their genius to it. And we all come affected by the history of the church, by the way we view Scripture. And it's wise, when we think about authority, to, to think about what tradition we come from, what shaped us, even if we didn't realize it had. And to let the Spirit guide us into truth. But also to read the book and read what it says. And when we think about authority as well, authority... In churches, does it come from leadership or the membership of the church? Some churches organize themselves like a democracy where the power and the authority is in the membership. To become a part of that church, you might have to have an interview. You get to vote at the annual general meeting. You've got the power to uh, appoint or get rid of leaders, you know, property and all that sort of stuff. And then some churches have a leadership style that's apostolic, where it's top-down, you know, where, where, where... it's leadership that carries the spiritual authority in that tradition. And actually, even the Catholics and Anglicans are probably apostolic in their makeup, I'd say. But that's a bit both handish. But in reality, there's an authority in the body of Christ, and there's an authority in leadership. And a wise and intelligent church, leadership will listen to the body of Christ, and the body will listen to leadership. That's how it works in intelligent church. You know when the early church were debating Acts 15? And, um, and they have a debate. And then they're able to recognize the authority of God speaking through one another. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us. They write for their churches. So it's both and. And church structures. Large or small. Organic or organized. Dispersed or attractional. What should church be like? Some people think that churches should be small. That's where the most energy is. That's where churches really grow. Some people think that churches should be large. That's where the most energy is, and that's where churches really grow. We think churches should be both. Let's not say, I like small church, and that's what I'm going to go for, or I like big church. Why can't we be part of both? And one of the the, the key geniuses of Woodlands is that we seek to be and honor small church and large church at the same time and encourage people where possible, where their time and energy permits, to have in their diet both small church and large church. And we call small church things like pastorates, home groups. Some of our congregations are, are small. They might be a, an urban mission partnership, such as St. James in Lotleys or All Saints Church in Harcliffe. But they're a, a place where you can do church, and you can do church where the prime paradigm is family, where it's that extended family group, where there might be 30 or 40 or 50 people, where you can be known, where you can serve, where you can be pastored, where you can be noticed, where you can shape things, where mission happens, where you can participate. And small church is great at participation. And that's what it's for. But large church does some other things well. Its job is to be inspirational and resourcing and strategic. It's designed to network large numbers of people together so it can have an impact on a whole city and region. It's designed to have a kind of... uh, to be able to bring in or a, an excellence in some of the gifts that churches really need. It's, it's there to provide wisdom 
consultancy resource for resources to flow. It's there to be so visible that it has a life of its own that's attractional. How many people here tonight, for instance, came to Woodlands Church not knowing anybody in this church when they first came? You just put your hands up if, if that was true for you. If you look around, there's a lot of people who came just because Woodlands Church had that sort of size and visibility. That's not normal. It's not normal to go to church like that. Big church could do some things that small church can't do. Small church could do some things that big church can't do. Big church is rubbish at noticing people. About knowing people as individuals. So we design it so it works together. And in our newcomers process, we want to say to people, if you're not part of small church, we want you to come along to our newcomer stuff so that you can find your place in a community where you can serve, be pastored, and learn to be discipled. And that's what small church does best. So both and. Are we gathered or are we dispersed? Sorry if this is a bit technical. I'll, I'll, Nettie's looking at me. She's saying, come on, David, for goodness sake. It's 20 past eight. I'm hot, tired. It's a bank holiday tomorrow, Nettie. I know you're going to go home and have gin. <laughs> anyway. She, not a word of lie. She had a lot of gin for her birthday, that woman. Um, As Nettie said to me on the way to the, to the um, she said, F five gins is one too many. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Good. We're a city church. We're gathered because we want to reach a whole city. We're also a local church. We want to see church planted in regions, in communities, in people groups all around our city. We'd love you to be part of that journey with us, to be a both and church. We can gather and we can disperse. We can be both. We don't have to trade one for the other. So, along all that both and thinking, usually there's a continuum. You will find yourself, by preference, somewhere on the line between one and the other. You might find yourself somewhere on the line between being a prophetic person and a very rational person, and where you are on the line. You may be someone whose preference is for small church, but you do large church sometimes. There are some people who are, hardly, who are part of Woodlands who hardly ever come into this building because most of their church is in small church. You might be someone who says, oh, I really like coming to large church, but I haven't really got time for small church, but I, I think I need to get connected. You can join a pastorate like mine, which only meets once a month, but gives you a small church experience. But we want to have both and. Think where you are on the continuum of practice, organization. But do think about both and when it comes to judging other Christians. I think this is not just a semantic issue. It's not about fudging difficult issues. It's whether or not we have got the spiritual and social maturity to live with creative tension, and whether we can go for our area of passion when other people alongside us follow different passions. And that's a real challenge, isn't it? Sometimes think, if you're not following my passion, you're not a real Christian. The Holy Spirit's obviously not speaking to you because he's speaking to me so powerfully, this must be it. But the, the reality of life is that we're meant to be diverse, and we need to follow different passions. And um, I'm, I'm really glad that there are people in this church who are doing things for God that I don't even know about and have started stuff and are passionate about stuff and, and do things that I could never do. And I don't want everyone to be like me and, and neither would you want everyone to be like me. But we need one another in the mix. And actually we need the whole church in the city as well. And, and some people like doing church in a, in a very different way from us. But let's not say that they're not following God or not doing church. Let's celebrate the diversity of the body of Christ. And let's kind of find a, a way of being church that we can grow church with all kinds of people. I, I love the fact we have multiple services here. That we have both in this evening service, large church and small church down below in the crypt. Hello down there, by the way. Great worship tonight. Lovely fiddle playing Pete. And also we've got bit of theology going on upstairs. We've got all sorts of things going on at once. We've already had three services, all different here today, because we want to do both and. And as we go forward into the future, 
God is passionate about Bristol. And we need all kinds of ministries and expressions of church to reach a whole city. I, I was um, down at VegFest this afternoon, and um, Robin's band was playing there, and it was a great environment there, and, and someone commented that, um, how come being a vegetarian equates to not washing? Because <laughs> but they were prejudiced, you see. Because Anyway, but... Um, but there's, there's, you know, we, we need to reach communities. We need to reach everybody's into saving the planet environmentally and say, that's a God-given call. We need to say, we, we need to, to bless people who, who love, not just the planet, but love animals because that's a God-given call. God loves animals. He made them. And, and we love to reach the carnivores as well because God loves them too. He says, you can eat of anything. And let's do all the glory of God. I probably said some indiscreet things tonight, and probably I need to stop. So I'm gonna, this is how I'm going to finish. We, 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 had a, we had fun tonight celebrating. How many people enjoyed the worship at the start of the service? And you're saying, I wish you'd shut up, David, so we could have a bit more. But, um, you know, some people probably struggled with it as well, because we're both on church. And in church, at any one time, people are happy and people are sad. That's what James says, doesn't he, in his letter. He says, is anyone in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. And as we finish our service tonight, and there will be something for students downstairs afterwards in the crypt, we'll just have a little quick both and time. And we're going to go back into worship. But if you're in trouble tonight, we'd like to pray for you. If you're sad, if you're suffering, if you're sick, if you, it's hard for you to stand up and celebrate, then... God knows that too. If you find it hard to identify with a happy, clappy church, if you're hard to identify with me or us, God knows that. But he's here by his spirit. And so as we stand in a moment or two and go back into worship, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone in trouble? Let them pray. And we're just going to be over by the side chapel, maybe in the side chapel if it's quite loud, but it's going to be a bit quieter actually, the worship. We're going to take a chance to pray for people, and then we're going to have a couple of big songs to finish with. So we'll do a bit of praying and then we're going to finish with a whoop and a hoop. And tomorrow, Stefan and Johanna are getting married in this church. Are they here tonight? They're not here, probably. Anyway, they're probably. But what we would like to do, I would love your help just to get it a bit ready for them. So particularly tonight. If you can give a bit of extra time at the end, we can just put the chairs away, clear the rubbish, run a hoover over. That will make a lot of difference. So that's how we're going to finish. Bit of prayer, bit of worship, bit of hoovering. <laughs> Both and church. Yeah? We love it. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you that by your spirit you're with us now. And we thank you, Lord God, that you, you take the very human dynamics of serving one another and you know our, our human frailties, but we also, Lord, you can do anything. Your spirit's here. The impossible can happen. And, and people can get healed tonight. People can find salvation tonight because you're here. And yet we, we may also leave here carrying our very human concerns, but you know them, Lord God. So Holy Spirit, will you come? Will you be with us? Will you help us to serve you in spirit and truth? In Jesus' name, amen.